Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I hope you can hear me. So if you can, raise your hand and let me know that you can hear me. Okay. Yay! All right. Wonderful. We're sorry about the delay. Um, so, and for our speakers, we're just going to start really quickly um, over again. I hope that's okay. Um, so we were just Starting with um, just quick kind of guidelines around the webinar. We want to make sure that it's really interactive. So we hope that you'll send us your questions um, throughout the webinar. And please feel free to use the chat. Also, we'll be asking a few polling questions throughout. So anytime, feel free to raise your hand um, and, and let us know what you're thinking. Um, we're really eager to, to help all of you um, better get a better understanding of, of the landscape of the death penalty, um, but also to make sure that, that we're partners in your work. So to get us started, um, oops, sorry about that. We have here, um, our speakers for tonight are include Jordana Rosenfeld and Ebony McLeese, who are part of the National Youth Action Committee. Hi, Jordana. Hi, everybody. Great. We also have, um, Laura Moy, and, who's the director of the Death Penalty Abolition Campaign, and Brian Evans, who is um, our campaigner. Hey, guys, can you hear us? Hey, Brian. Hey, Laura. Hey, thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Okay. And then we also have Mary, who's our State Death Penalty Abolition Coordinator from Tennessee. State Death Penalty Abolition Coordinator from Tennessee. Hi. How are you doing? I'm glad you guys were able to join us tonight. Great. Um, so to get us started, Jordana was just telling us a little bit about the National Student Week of Action and its connection to the Death Penalty Awareness Week. Hey, Jordana. Hi. So yeah, the um, National Student Week of Action is something that used to be a big part of Amnesty International USA in years past, and we thought about bringing it back this year and decided to combine it sort of with Death Penalty Awareness Week because um, sort of in response to the outpouring of student activism and action that we saw in relation to campaigning for Troy Davis earlier this year, and we really feel that students have a lot of power and a lot of leverage as human rights activists and in this fight to end the death penalty, and we want to combine all of our forces and, and propel ourselves forward with um, the National Student Week of Action slash Death Penalty Awareness Week combination. And our goal for this event, which is really two weeks, is to have one student action in every state. And as you will see on the next slide when we progress there, we are very much on our way to that goal. We've got 70 schools participating in events in 30 states, and our goal is all 50 states. So we've still got states like North Dakota and New Mexico where there isn't much going on for now. But we're definitely going to get there with all of your help. Great. Thanks, Jordana. And just a quick round. Um, if you see, um, if you don't see your state or if you don't see your school, just, just raise your hand and we'll make sure to, to get that up there. Um, wonderful. And now I'm going to hand it over to Laura Moy, who's, um, who can take us through, through the agenda and, and the death penalty landscape. Hey, hey everybody who... Thanks again to everybody who's joined us tonight. We're really excited about the response that we got uh, and the energy that we can feel building uh, around the country and really around the world to see uh, an end to the death penalty. It's something we believe is going to happen uh, in, the, in the not too distant future and certainly within our lifetimes because of the amazing um, movement building uh, and work that is being done um, particularly in the United States at this moment. I'm going to give you an overview of the uh, death penalty in the United States, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brian and Mary to give some pointers on how to talk about this issue, because sometimes it can be a little bit heated, or you might find people who are not uh, with you naturally on this issue initially. And then we're going to talk about very concrete ways for how you can uh, be involved and, and get involved with this struggle. Uh, and then wrap up with some next steps, things that we'll be sending you, uh, and that sort of thing. 
I would like to say a special thanks to um, State Radio and their Counting All Crows uh, network of activists for also partnering with us this year on Death Penalty Action Weeks. We're very excited for the support and the uh, reach that, um, that State Radio and the Crows have, have given to this issue, among other human rights issues that we care about. All right, Cynthia, next. And next. When you look at the death penalty in the world, what you see is a trend towards abolition. When we started this work uh, several decades ago, there were only 16 countries in the world that did not use or have the death penalty. Today, two-thirds of the world's countries do not uh, have the death penalty either in law or practice. That's really quite remarkable, and every year that list has been growing. More and more um, uh, instruments and decisions ha and statements have been made at the United Nations to affirm this trend that the world is viewing this more and more as a human rights issue. Uh, and so this consensus is very exciting. We're seeing momentum towards abolition at the global level. Uh, and, and also at the national level. Um, but currently, the United States is out of step with this trend, and that's very unfortunate um, for a country that calls itself a, a leader for human rights. For the last many years, we have found ourselves in the top five of countries that carry out the most number of executions. That means that our government is in the company of regimes that we often don't look to for leadership in human rights, such as China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, Pakistan, North Korea. It's, it's not really uh, uh, very good for our reputation as a human rights leader to, to be a leader in executions. Next slide. But the good news is that that trend is also uh, has been coming to the United States. Since 2007, four states have gotten rid of the death penalty. New York, New Jersey, New Mexico, and last year, Illinois. Uh, and this has come as a result uh, of not chance or coincidence, but because people are getting organized. People have been uh, working in coalitions with lawmakers, with people on different sides of the political aisle, with law enforcement, with murder victims' families, to bring about legislative change um, in, in three of those states that, that I mentioned. And we are so excited to, to see that progress developing in other states. We believe that Maryland and Connecticut, for example, are the next couple of states on that list of states uh, that will be uh, joining the, the, the abolitionist category. Um, so the death penalty in the United States really, for the most part, is a state-specific issue, uh, and our work is very focused on the states. Uh, it is true we have a federal death penalty and a military death penalty, uh, but we are very much focused on ending it in the states where it is most prevalent. Next slide. We view the death penalty as a human rights violation, uh, and as I say, more and more people around the world uh, are, are acknowledging that fact. In the United States, I don't think that uh, we have reached a critical mass where people view it in such terms. People think of the death penalty as an issue of crime and punishment, but they have yet to recognize the fundamental human rights that are violated by this outmoded and inhuman practice. This slide is entitled, Human Rights Are Violated Twice. What I wanted to do with that title is to acknowledge the fact that the death penalty is offered in this country primarily as a response to violent crimes, to, to murders. It's supposed to be meted out for the worst crimes that happen. Uh, but the way we see it, rather than being a solution to violence, the death penalty furthers the cycle of violence and imitates the crime that it is condemning. Murder is indeed uh, a violation of the right to life and is cruel and inhuman but we don't think it's the place of our society through our governments to imitate those values. We think that we can do much better and honor human rights. Next slide. That's right, two wrongs don't make a right is the bumper sticker version of what I just said. Okay, in other ways uh, we see many problems with uh, upholding human rights in the way the death penalty is practiced. There are many human rights standards uh, that, that this country has um, ratified that are violated in the way the death penalty is carried out. Uh, the death penalty um, 
is, is not applied equally. It's, as I said, supposed to be meted out uh, for crimes that are the so-called worst of the worst. But in reality, uh, if you were to look at people on death row and people who are serving life sentences, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell based on their sentences who committed the most graphic or heinous of crimes. Next slide. So to start with, the death penalty is very much uh, biased against the poor. The quality of legal defense that people have uh, who face the death penalty is often very weak. That's not because uh, public defenders or people assigned to cases uh, necessarily don't care. A lot of times public defenders are very hard-working individuals uh, who, who work for very small salaries with very, very minimal resources to do the kind of investigation that are needed in cases that can be quite complicated, uh, i.e. capital cases. Uh, and many states have been trimming those budgets uh, more and more, making it even more difficult uh, for people to receive an adequate uh, representation. Um, so it's, when you look at who is on death row, you're not going to find wealthy people. Uh, a person's economic status, their ability to access quality legal defense uh, is, is very much one of the leading factors for, for who you'll find on death row. Next. Race plays a huge part in the entire uh, process of the death penalty uh, from start to finish. And you see the prevalence of racial bias most acutely when you look at who it is that uh, is the victim in a murder case. So the overwhelming majority of people uh, who are on death row are there for crimes committed against white individuals, despite the fact that about half of homicide victims in this country are actually people of color. So in some ways you could make the argument that our justice system values uh, the lives of, of white people more in terms of deciding who is going to receive the harshest punishment. Next slide. The death penalty is a lot like getting hit by lightning. With just under 2% of people who commit murders receiving the, this so-called ultimate punishment, um, you know, it's interesting to note that uh, some counties are much more responsible for sending people to death row than others. And again, it doesn't really have to do with the graphicness of the crimes. It has to do with the politics of the jurisdiction where the crime occurs. So in Atlanta, for example, where, where I used to live and, and work in the Amnesty Southern Regional Office, if you were to commit a murder on Paces Ferry Road in Fulton County, the urban uh, uh, county, uh, and you were to commit the same crime uh, on the Cobb County side, the suburban county uh, side of the same street, you would be very likely to go to death row for committing it in the uh, suburban county as compared with the urban county. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that prosecutors in some counties are much more eager to seek the death penalty. Uh, some have more resources to work with. Uh, and also jury pools are also different. Um, but the, the challenge with prosecutors being elected officials and uh, the fact that crime has become so politicized in this country are very bad um, uh, elements in the equation of what happens with our criminal justice system. Next slide. Not only is the death penalty uh, a human rights violation, the death penalty is failed public policy. Uh, there are so many errors that happen in death penalty cases. Uh, the Liebman study out of Columbia University showed that 70 percent of all death sentences are reversed due to serious errors. Um, and on top of that, uh, we've seen the number of death row exonerations um, grow over the years. Next slide. So in this chart, you see that we have 140 individuals since 1973 who were released from death rows due to evidence of their innocence. That's 140 people who could have become uh, wrongful uh, who could have been wrongfully executed. 
Uh, that is a pretty shocking statistic if you want to think about error rates uh, uh, in, in a system that is entrusted with so much power. And I think that the fact that um, you know, DNA evidence has really become uh, more um, widely understood uh, and the issues around innocence and wrongful convictions are, are getting more attention is really helping jurors to think twice about whether uh, they want to uh, vote for the death penalty. And I think it's one factor why death sentences are actually on a downturn. But of course, in capital cases, very few of them have biological material that can be DNA tested. And most of the people, these 140 individuals who've been exonerated, didn't have the benefit of DNA. So there certainly are no magic bullets for ensuring that we never execute an innocent person. And I think one common ground argument that you can always make is that in a human system, you can never be sure that an innocent person won't be executed. And what error rate is acceptable when you're talking about human life? Next slide. Deterrence is one of the biggest myths about the death penalty, although I think more people are accepting uh, that it really does not have a proven deterrent value. There are a number of studies that have been done on deterrence. The overwhelming majority of them show that the death penalty doesn't have a deterrent value. In fact, 88% of uh, academic uh, criminological society presidents uh, reject the notion that it has a deterrent value. You see this graph here that shows states without the death penalty have lower murder rates uh, as compared with states with the death penalty. Um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, most people who commit uh, murders are not doing it uh, with a lot of pre-thought. They're certainly not planning to get caught. Uh, a lot of people are also messed up on drugs and alcohol and are not making very sound judgments uh, and so not evaluating what kind of punishments they may get. Next slide. Next, okay. Um, the one most counterintuitive fact about the death penalty is that it's actually much more expensive than the next harshest punishment, life without parole. Uh, you could spend uh, about $740,000 uh, to incarcerate someone permanently uh, versus a couple of million dollars uh, to have somebody ultimately executed. And my computer's locking up, and I will get it back. Here we go. Um, the state of Florida, for example, would save $51 million a year uh, if everybody on its death row uh, had a life without parole sentence. California, there have been different studies. In fact, this number has gotten larger uh, since the last time it was studied, but they would save at least $137 million per year if the 700 plus people on their death row had their sentence changed to life without parole as opposed to the death penalty. And I'm just making the comparison with life without parole because it's the next harshest punishment, not because it's a punishment we necessarily advocate. So at every stage in the process, a, a capital case is so much more expensive than the death penalty. This is not the cost of lethal injection drugs that we're talking about that makes this punishment more expensive. Uh, and it's tragic that we spend so much more on death cases when, as we talked about earlier, the error rate is so high and the possibility of wrongfully convicting people uh, is, is so dismal. Next uh, slide. So the good news is, hey, we can live without the death penalty. Uh, there are so many reasons to oppose the death penalty, uh, and the good news is that there are so many amazing things we could be doing with those millions of dollars instead of the death penalty. We're really looking forward to the day when the conversation really changes to those positive solutions. Next slide. So if you were to think about uh, these tens of millions of dollars, uh, even hundreds of millions, if you'll cue the next bullet points, um, think about what it is that you might want to spend your money on. Prevention issues, public safety, uh, next uh, bullet point or graph. I think something else is supposed to pop up there. Yeah, there we go. Law enforcement was polled by the Death Penalty Information Center about uh, what it is that they would like to see um, in terms of, of priorities for what would help them 
uh, to, to deal with violent crime. And, and you can see that they don't put the death penalty right at the top. A lot of uh, police officers will tell you that the death penalty doesn't make their lives any easier or the, the communities any safer. Um, and so there's a list of things um, uh, that, that really uh, police are telling us they could use to help in, in controlling for violent crime. Um, next. And if you just cue all the bullet points. Um, there are a lot of needs that come in the wake of violent crime. And just because we oppose the death penalty doesn't mean that we are cold to those needs. In fact, uh, we really believe that there are human rights solutions, uh, human rights friendly solutions to violent crime. There are many needs uh, and rights that victims and loved ones have. Uh, and that communities have. Uh, communities have the right to be safe and governments ought to provide for our safety and there are a, a variety of ways in which they can do that. Um, the, when you, we talk about alternatives to the death penalty, we really emphasize that there isn't one alternative. There are many things that we ought to be considering as a society uh, to help us with that and Amnesty International doesn't propose just sort of one solution or one list of solutions, but we really would like to encourage a dialogue where we think very seriously about the needs of people who suffer in the wake of violent crime and the needs of communities to be uh, safe from, from crime uh, and to think about uh, prevention uh, and, and to not just deal with these problems once a person has gotten to the point where they're commi committing a horrible act of murder. Go to the next slide. So how do we take on abolition of the death penalty? It seems like such a big, undaunting boulder, but we're going to whack that boulder with the next, if you cue the next couple of things, with our Amnesty brand color mallet. <laughs> and so we've got a three-pronged strategy for approaching abolition of the death penalty. One, public education is huge, and that sounds perhaps a little bit generic, but the truth is the more people understand the death penalty, the less likely they are to support it. Um, whether people start out from the same moral persuasion or orientation that you or I do, uh, once they learn what the death penalty is really about and how the system has really failed in a number of ways, uh, people often come around to, to the position that the death penalty ought to be done away with. Uh, they may disagree on what it should be replaced with, but I think a lot of people have things in common. Uh, people want to live in a society where they feel safe. They want to live in a society where people are held accountable for hor horrific crimes, where those things are prevented, where we honor the, um, uh, the, 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 the person who has been uh, murdered and honor their families and, and their uh, process of, of healing. So public education is huge and you can really be a part of that solution whether you're organizing events on your campus or in your community and there's so many creative ways that you can do that. Our Death Penalty Action uh, Weeks kit has a bunch of ideas and resources. The second is to really focus on the states. The 34 states where we have the death penalty are especially in need of um, strategic and tailored support that's going to line up with the strategy that that, that state coalition uh, has helped to develop. And we want you to get in touch with your state death penalty abolition coordinator, which you can find in the um, DEPA kit. We have a list of those folks. Maryland and Connecticut, for example, have legislative repeal campaigns that are very active right now, and we really want folks to get uh, plugged into that. In California, they're collecting signatures to put abolition on the ballot and we really would love your help with that right now. So when you connect with your state death penalty abolition coordinator, you can find out what it is that's going on in your state if you belong to a death penalty state. Now if you live in a state that doesn't have the death penalty, we still want your help with public education and helping us with our case campaigns because there's always the risk that, especially in the wake of a horrible crime, that some lawmakers may try to take advantage of people's fears and bring the death penalty back to your state. So we can't think of the death penalty as simply a finish line. It has to be a perpetual state where people reject the notion that 
taking human life in the name of justice is really um, uh, both counter to human rights and unproductive. The third prong in our strategy is working on emblematic case campaigns. So Troy Davis is maybe our, our most famous, particularly in recent years. We are working on a guy's case in Missouri named Reggie Clemens, and we'll talk more about him. But these cases are important vehicles, not just to help those one, uh, th that one individual, but to really tell the story, to put a face on this issue and to explain why it is that this system is failing us uh, and why it must go. So we invite you to be involved with our emblematic case campaigns to really help people to understand the death penalty in a way beyond sort of just statistics and, and arguments, but to really connect with the issue in a more human way. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian, uh, my, my uh, co-pilot in the Death Penalty Abolition Campaign, and Mary, one of our wonderful state death penalty abolition coordinators, to talk to you about sort of some approaches, talk to you about sort of some approaches. and to take some of your questions. Great. So, um, so Brian and Mary, we've been getting lots of questions from people on the, on the webinar. Um, one of the questions that we've gotten from, from Danielle is um, she's curious what to say to people that believe that the person that killed or committed a crime to someone they know should die. How do we justify not allowing that for the people who feel they need that closure? Um, Brian, do you want to take that one or do you want me to take that one? I guess I'll take that one. Um, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, so that was okay. actually, um, coming into this webinar, I was thinking of the toughest questions that have ever been asked, and, you know, what are the tough questions about the death penalty, and that is the exact question that came to my mind first. Um, and I think that's definitely um, a really difficult one, especially if someone says, well, what if it happened to your family member, or what if it happened to someone close to you? I mean, how could you not want to see that person be killed or executed. Um, and I think in that sense, you can use the argument that um, there are many murder victims, family members that have come out and, you know, that have come out against the death penalty and have sought um, against that sentence and also that have come out after the fact and said, you know, actually this doesn't provide any closure. This isn't the justice that I was seeking. Um, and talk about how, you know, executing someone is also creating um, more victims and that the, the family members of, of the offender become victims in that sense too. And that, I mean, though everyone has, you know, different feelings about, you know, how would it feel, how would you feel if you were in that situation? I mean, you know, bring it back to the argument, there's so many people that have come out and said, you know, this is not what I want. And, you know, those voices are being heard across the country and that that's becoming more well known. So, I mean, bringing it back to murder victims' families, I think, is always um, the best bet in that situation. And Brian, you're, Brian, you're, you're off, mute. off mute. Yep. Yeah, I was on mute earlier. Sorry. I think uh, what Laura said earlier about um, really, uh, we're not just talking about why the death penalty is bad. We're talking about how to come up with a better way of dealing with violent crime, and that that includes uh, addressing the needs of victims. And if you look at the cost uh, studies and all of that, um, supporting victims. Uh, through uh, psychological counseling and through financial uh, victims, families suffer financially if they lose a breadwinner. These things are a lot more important to victims than uh, putting somebody on death row where uh, you probably saw the statistics. It's, most, it's more likely than not that they'll never be executed and for 98% of murders there, there's not a death sentence uh, in the works anyway. So really we're, we're doing uh, victims a disservice by, by holding up this sort of uh, uh, the charade of, of capital punishment that is carried out you know, 50 times a year when we have 15,000 murders a year, we're not doing it for victims, we're doing it sort of for, for show. And if we really want to support victims, we need to, to endorse policies that help them at, uh, after the crime and, and help them deal with the loss and get on with their lives. Thanks, Brian. Um, I did want to send it, I know Jordana had a question that she hears a lot from high schools. Um, Jordana, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I think 
one of the hardest questions to deal with is the sort of variation on, well, what if the person actually did it? Doesn't, don't they deserve to die in that case? Like, questions that draw you away from the facts about the death penalty, about how it's classist and really expensive. The sort of more, like, human, emotional side of it is harder to deal with. Unmuted. Well, this is Ryan again. Um, Were there sort of two, Ryan. Two, Ryan. Answers Ryan. two answers today? Two answers today? No, there might be a little delay here. Um, yeah, the, the first answer, it depends on who you're talking to when you're dealing with these tough questions. If you're talking to a more libertarian type person, I always like to talk about how you know, the death penalty is the ultimate abuse of government power. The government shouldn't be given the power to kill prisoners uh, no, matter, no matter who they are. That's a power we should not cede to government. But the, but the other answer is that it's not about one particular case. Um, you know, and most people on death row are guilty of terrible crimes. It's about a system that we know makes mistakes, that we know is biased, and that we know ends up convicting innocent people uh, quite frequently. And we just uh, cannot have a punishment, an irreversible punishment like execution, uh, with the system that makes mistakes. Mary, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I totally agree with everything that Brian said. I mean, I, yeah, sure. I was just, um, I agree with everything that he said, and I was just going to say, just know your audience. Um, just know who, who it is you're speaking to and, and what kind of, like, perspective are they coming from, um, and just bring it back to, bring it back to the facts and bring it back to, like, well, this is what's happening. I mean, it just, it really just depends, like, knowing your audience and who you're speaking to, um, definitely. Great. And we've got another question here from, from Gabriella. Um, um, are there any intermediate steps that can be taken to eliminate the death penalty? Um, any intermediary goals we should be aiming for that would lead to eliminating the death penalty? So, Brian, Mary? Well, this is Brian. I'll, I'll start. Like, intermediate steps. Um, that there was, uh, when uh, Governor Ryan in Illinois declared the moratorium in 2000 in Illinois, that sort of created a movement to try to establish moratoriums in various different states to, to stop executions as an intermediate step. Uh, that's sort of been uh, bypassed as you know, four states, as, as Laura mentioned, have abolished the death penalty. Although we saw in Oregon in November that governor declared a moratorium on executions in his state. So there, there's a lot of uh, steps that, that people in different states are taking. I'm sure Mary can talk about what's happening in Tennessee trying to reduce executions and, and show people that they can live without the death penalty as a precursor to actually abolishing it. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I was just going to say that um, some of the, the states that don't really have the legislators on their side at this point um, are doing different things, like Tennessee right now um, is proposing what we proposed last year and are still working on a, a mental illness bill, which is a bill to um, exempt those with severe and persistent mental illness from the death penalty. So like the, you know, the idea that Laura mentioned chipping away at the block, like for Tennessee, that is very strategic in that, you know, if we could get this mental illness bill through, then we are getting ourselves closer to abolition. But in some states, like going towards abolition is the best strategy for that state. And then, I don't know, many of you may have heard of the, um, the Racial Justice Act um, and the Carolinas and like things like that. There's there's different um, smaller steps that can be taken um, in some states. It really just depends on like what is you know, what's the legis legislative like ground going on right now and like how is it is it in favor of abolition or should you chip away with a, with something else like a mental illness bill? Great. Um, one of our other questions is from Charlotte. Um, who founded the death penalty? Where and how did it originate? So I'm not sure, maybe Brian, if you want to start? Um, I think, I don't, I don't know ancient history, but it obviously goes back to the very, you know, beginnings of human civilization. I guess uh, the, the idea of an eye for an eye is in the Code of Hammurabi, which, uh, you know, I'm no historian, I don't know how old that is, but it's really, you know, thousands of years old. Uh, so, so the idea of, of taking somebody's life as a punishment is, is for a crime is, is very, very, very old. Uh, the idea of abolishing and not taking somebody's life is, is not so old. I think the first uh, sort of principalities in Italy that abolished it did so 
maybe in the 1500s, little like things, uh, little small principalities. Um, the first U.S. jurisdiction to do it was Michigan in 1846, um, and the first English-speaking jurisdiction in the world was Michigan. Um, so it's abolishing the death penalty is kind of a recent phenomenon, sort of like maybe the same as abolishing slavery is kind of a recent phenomenon. But capital punishment, like slavery and things like that, is, is as old as humanity, I think. One question that we do have is from Craig. What is yeah, being I mean, I, I one question that we do have is from Craig. What is being Sorry, Mary, did you want to finish that um, response? Sorry, Mary, did you want to finish that? No, response? no, I think I think you covered that. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, and sorry, everyone, for the echo. We're, we're trying to um, fix that. Um, but we do have a question from Craig, um, and that is, what is being done to achieve abolition of, of the federal um, death penalty, I guess on the federal level? Brian? Well, <laughs> if, if you're familiar with our Congress uh, um, and our president right now, trying to actually achieve a lot of progress on the federal death penalty, it, you know, is not a realistic goal right now. So we are working mostly at the state level to sort of build uh, build a uh, sort of constituency for abolition. Uh, we now have uh, 16 out of the 50 states have abolished the death penalty, so that's 32 senators come from abolitionist states, still not a majority. Um, the main strategies or the main tactics that are going on right now with the federal death penalty have to do with litigation, have to do with preventing uh, death sentences, preventing executions. I think there's maybe 60 people on federal death row, so it's a pretty small number compared to some states. Um, and there hasn't been a federal execution uh, since uh, 2005, maybe, maybe even earlier. So, so right now, there, there's mainly it's the lawyers who are fighting to prevent executions and prevent more death sentences in the federal death penalty. The political climate just uh, in the United States Congress and with the United States administration, it's just not there to try anything more than that right now, unfortunately. Unmuted. Unmuted. Great. Um, we do have one question from Kerry um, wanting to know, what is the most important thing we can do as a student group um, or as a student for the death penalty action weeks? And I'm going to also unmute Jordana for this question as well. Well, I'll go first. I'm Brian again. Um, I, I think uh, getting out there and doing something uh, that your, camp, your campus and community will see is very important. Um, bringing in, to me, the, the bringing in a speaker, an exoneree who used to be on death row or a victim family member, those are, the, are really the most powerful kind of things that you can do on your campus. And your camp, campuses are tailor-made for that kind of thing, bringing in speakers. And also, you know, your community can come to the event as well. I think. You as a student group can can not just you know educate your campus about the death penalty. You can educate the entire community because you have you know a campus at your disposal where you can bring these speakers in. And you know most people think all victims' families favor the death penalty. If you bring in a victim family member who tells uh, what it's really like, you know, to to have a, a to have the death penalty uh, after some, your loved one is murdered, I think there's there's really nothing that could be more powerful than that. Great, Jordana, did you want to add? About, um, well, I was well, listening to what Brian just said. I am planning on organizing a uh, panel on the death penalty in my school, a panel discussion. And we, a really useful thing in the planning process for me so far has been to coordinate a way that students can come see the panel during class time, during school time, so that it's accessible and not something that they have to go out of their way in order to participate in. And there has been a lot of interest so far, and I think people are really interested in educating themselves about this issue, and it's great to be able to make that information readily available for them. Unmuted. Um, so just to piggyback off what they both said, um, I always found um, when I was in 
in undergrad and college that speakers were the most powerful. I also did a panel. Um, also, if, if you're planning an event, um, hook up with different groups. Like if there's a law school at your, at your school or in your community, hook up with them. Um, hook up with, you know, the philosophy department, different departments in different schools or different, like, organizations um, maybe that work on other human rights issues in your community, like, kind of pull from different areas um, because people can come together. Um, if, if they have a human, right, human rights interest or a legal interest, they can come together for your event and sort of pull their people together so that your event is bigger and has a wider reach. Um, yeah. Great. I mean, we're getting a lot of questions here about, one, um, if, if somebody signed up for an online action but are interested in, you know, changing that, um, can they still do that? Um, and maybe that's, uh, you know, sure you can. Um, and we'll follow up with you, um, Katie, on that. Um, the other question is, where, where would they be able to um, get contact with victims or exonerees for a teach-in at their school? That's, that's a great question, and, and in the materials we're going to send you, but I'll tell you here as well, there's organizations that provide both exonerees. Uh, there's a group called Witness to Innocence, which is witnesstoinnocence.org, but we'll send you the information, witnesstoinnocence.org. Um, they support uh, people who've been exonerated from, from prison, you know, in, in terms of, you know, helping them find housing and jobs and things like that, but also uh, support them uh, to go out and speak. And there are exonerees all over the country, so there's probably one near you. And there are two uh, victim family groups, Murder Victim Families for Reconciliation, mvfr.org, and Murder Victims Families for Human Rights, mvfhr.org, uh, both of which provide speakers uh, to, to groups like yours um, who are uh, lost loved ones to violent crime and, and are opposed to the death penalty. We'll get that information to everybody on the call. Um, one more thing to add. If you have a state coalition in your state, so if there's a, an organization that does specifically death penalty work, um, partnering with them on the, the event that you're interested in doing, they know so many people and have so many resources and can also like help with the cost because it can be, um, you can get funding from your school, but you can also work with the organization. So like, and, we can we can give you the information from Amnesty, but like we can let you know if, if your state has a, a coalition organization that does death penalty work specifically, they're always like a really great resource because um, they might even know um, someone who's not a part of Witness to Innocence that's an exoneree in a state that you know would be willing to do a talk. Um, so and you know it'd be it'd be great to pull in people locally because um, I think that really has a big impact if you're like oh well this person from our state was exonerated and here they are speaking about it. So that's all I wanted to add. Great. Thanks, Mary. And if you want, everyone, here, here are some of the, um, the links and toolkits um, that have been mentioned by both Brian, Mary, and Jordana. Um, so within the Death Penalty Action Week kit, you'll definitely be able to find um, all of the different organizations that Brian mentioned, as well as um, bios on potential speakers. Um, also, you know, um, there's a lot of great information, including, you know, some of that background information that we went over, that Laura went over as well. Um, some questions that people have are, you know, like, what exactly is a panel? And I think that the toolkit really helps explain that. And so, you know, whether you're looking at bringing experts to your school or to your community event um, to talk about the issue, and, and a panel is just, you know, an opportunity for, for audiences to hear from experts, and that can look in lots of different ways. Um, so there's lots of really great information in that toolkit. Um, is there anything else, Brian or, or Mary or Jordana, that you want to add? Well, I would just say one, one other thing that, that students can do um, is get together in a group and take a little time to go visit our, our to visit with your whoever represents you in the state legislature. Uh, if you're in the state capital, that's easy. If not, they have an office in, in the district. Um, and it just tell them that you want them to vote for ab abolishing the death penalty. You may be in Texas where they won't, you know, have the chance to vote for abolishing the death penalty, but it doesn't matter. Uh, when, when these people hear young people come up and say um, they are against the death penalty, and they hear it often enough, and they, they know you're a voter for the next, you know, 60 or 70 years, it's going to make a difference. So 
if you have like a, a few hours one day or a couple hours to go set up a meeting like that and just say we want you to support abolition, I, I think that that's really helpful. And then in some states where there's a really active campaign like Maryland or Connecticut or Tennessee where, where there's a legislative campaign, uh, finding out what they're doing and, and meeting your legislator and talking about that, it's a really good experience. Um, and believe me, if a, if a legislator has a district of 50,000 people, he, he, he or she hears from maybe you know, five-tenths of one percent of those people. And if you're uh, some of those people, your voice is really magnified much more than it would be if you're just writing letters or sending emails. So if you have time to do something like that, that can be really effective. Um, just one word of encouragement. Um, even being on this webinar tonight, like you have to give us, give yourself props. Like this is definitely the most one of the most difficult issues to talk about, and people hear death penalty and they pretty much run from it. And so just just stay encouraged. Um, this is crucial work. It's so important. Um, stick with it. It's it's definitely worthwhile. Um, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, you know, one question that, that does come up, and then I think we're going to transition to the next part of, of the webinar, which is, of course, how to get involved. Um, and for everyone that we didn't get to their questions, we will be following up with you and, and kind of, you know, making sure that, that your question was answered. Um, but this question is from Karen. Um, she wants to know, should all political candidates running for office be asked about their position on the death penalty? And Laura, let us know if you want to also um, jump in on this. Well, that's, that's actually kind of tricky because if you back a politician into a corner and they say, they haven't really thought about it, their natural answer is going to be, yes, I'm for the death penalty. And once they've gone on record as saying that, it's very hard to, to get them to, you know, to flip because they don't want to look like a flip-flopper. So sometimes it's, it's actually better to just sort of you know, let them not take a position until you're ready. So it, it's a bit tricky. It depends on the state you're in. Um, you know, I, I think um, in a state like Texas, uh, it's good to find the people who are against the death penalty. Uh, in states where it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, it really depends on, on the circumstance. It's actually kind of tricky. Great. And Laura? Did you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I, I would just add that, um, yeah, thanks. I, I would just add that there are a couple of actions that I think people assume you want to do in any um, cause, uh, whether it's get in the face of the person who has the decision-making power, uh, ask politicians and needle them on the issue you care about. Um, but I think what we've been really trying to do in the death penalty abolition movement is to really have a certain tactical precision for, for really hitting the right pressure points to achieve success. And, you know, for example, the presidential um, uh, race is really d dominating the news right now. Um, is getting Obama to answer a question point blank about the death penalty the most effective thing we could be doing for our cause right now? Frankly, not really. Will it make us feel better to kind of you know, um, to 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 you know, try to put this in people's face. Maybe it will, but I think we need to really look at what are the realities in each of our states. And I think that's what Brian was getting at. You really need to know what's happening in your state and where the pressure points are. Um, I think uh, some of those kind of blanket activities are not not always the ones that work for every issue. And and I think we have to really figure out what is the strategy in your state. Some states are trying to move legislation where. It may not be useful to have a big splashy demo, you know, in front of the state capitol for for a certain type of reform. It's really about what is the goal and what are the appropriate tactics to get it done. Okay, great. Thanks, Laura. And I think this is a good transition for us into how to get involved. Okay, well, thanks again, and I, I wish we had more time for these questions, and if you don't mind, Cynthia, I'm, I'm going to do a bit of a moderator role like you've been doing, because I, I want to see how this hands-up thing works. But if you guys would like to see a webinar during the Death Penalty Action Weeks, perhaps with a featured speaker, a murder victim family member, a death row family member, or an exoneree, 
Um, raise your hand if you might uh, RSVP to uh, a call like that where you'd have an opportunity to hear from and maybe interact a little bit with some of these voices that are really close to this issue. And Cynthia, maybe you can help me kind of keep track of, of our response there. Yeah, I'm seeing lots so of hands come about up. getting involved. Yay, the hands are going. We've got a virtual wave happening out there. I can feel it. Um, so I want to go back to the three-prong strategy um, of doing uh, public education, tailored state work, and emblematic case campaigning. You can do something in each of these categories. Um, I, I, I can't emphasize enough the Death Penalty Action Weeks kit. Um, we spent a good bit of time putting this together and, and trying to really um, pick out resources and put in how-to guides that would really be as user-friendly as possible. So I hope that you will download that kit if you haven't already. There are many, many ideas about education, whether it's hosting a speaker. Brian mentioned some of the speakers that you could um, invite. And if you are going to invite a speaker, do make sure that you are paying attention to how to take care of their needs. Provide them with an honorarium. Make sure their logistics are set up for them. Uh, it's, it's not cool to invite a speaker if you're not prepared to have a little bit of a budget to make sure that their needs are taken care of. Um, and it's always good when you've got an honorarium. Some folks like exonerees um, don't have regular day jobs because they want to be flexible for the movement and to be um, you know, ready to respond as they're able. And you may not be used to sort of raising funds for honorariums, but it's very important to, to show your respect for them and to um, help them to, to, to be able to get by. And you should always look at what your resources are on a campus. If you belong, um, if, you, if you're not uh, a student and maybe you belong to other organizations or congregations, there are often many sources uh, for funding for those kinds of events. But uh, for education, like I said, there are a number of ideas in the kit that you can look at. Uh, anything from a, a simple tabling, uh, with literature on your campus or in your community to having a speaker, showing a film, having a discussion. I very much recommend discussions and not debates. I think debates can create a very negative climate where people get increasingly more attached to their original position rather than keeping an open mind. There are many creative visual uh, displays and artistic things that you could do. Uh, Dead Man Walking, uh, a novel written by Sister Helen Prejean that's been turned into every possible form of art, including a movie that, uh, that earned uh, at least one Academy Award, um, has also been turned into a play by Tim Robbins. And uh, there is a Dead Man Walking School Theater project. A link to that is also in the kit if you wanted to approach a couple of departments at your school to put that on. Uh, there are some photo exhibits. So we have a wonderful photographer in our midst named Scott Langley who's taken some powerful photographs uh, of Death Rose and the Troy Davis campaign and his information is also in the kit and he's also available to come and talk uh, to, to give sort of a, an annotated um, uh, spiel to some of these really amazing photographs and they've been printed on a larger scale so you can set up sort of a photo exhibit and that can often be paired with having a speaker come and speak. Um, definitely get familiar with the resource people in your um, state. Uh, in the kit on pages 11 through 13 you'll find your state death penalty abolition coordinator. That's your amnesty volunteer who can connect you with the state coalition, tell you what's going on in the state. Um, they are often people who can be speakers themselves and put you in touch with other people who are local who can come and give talks. Um, under state work, again, connect with your state death penalty abolition coordinator. If you don't have one, maybe you'd be interested in being one. We also have more than one in some states, so there's always an opportunity to apply for that or to learn more from us, whether you might be a good candidate for that position. Your field organizer in one of our five regional offices are listed in the kit. You can get in touch with them. They're another sort of entry point. And of course, the death penalty abolition campaign Brian and I are also happy to communicate with you if you're trying to connect with people in your state to find out what your state's strategy and greatest needs are. And then, um, you know, get involved. If you're in a state like Maryland and Connecticut, you can actually go to the lobby days. Uh, states like New Hampshire recently had to fight back an expansion of the death penalty bill. 
Um, so find out what those things are because there might be an exciting opportunity to go down to your state capital and to be part of the action. But always connect with your state coalition and your state death penalty abolition coordinator so that you are on target, that you're not working at cross purposes even with the best of intentions. Uh, you really want to do these things in collaboration to make sure that uh, what you're doing adds value and doesn't kind of uh, uh, go against the strategy. Emblematic case campaigns. Our featured campaign right now is that of Reggie Clemens. On the screen you see a picture or a drawing of Reggie Clemens. This is a screenshot from a video on our Reggie Clemens page. Our landing page for him is showmejustice.org. So if you go to showmejustice.org, uh, Missouri is the show me state, so we decided that uh, we ought to ask them to show me some justice.org. Um, so if you go to that website, you can watch this video to learn more about his very, very compelling case. A lot of similarities to Troy Davis. Um, you know, there's petition on that page that you can download and get people to sign during Death Penalty Action Weeks in an ongoing way. Um, there's also a, a fact sheet and report that you can download to share with people and to read. Um, we just learned today that the hearing that was scheduled for March 5th for Reggie Clemens has been delayed and we'll put more information up on our blog uh, when we learn sort of more about that, but we just got that, that news. But we're trying to build awareness about his case, so if you wanted to do a teach-in on him, we do have a PowerPoint that compares his case with Troy Davis and that's something that Death Penalty Abolition Campaign, DPAC, is happy to get to you. Um, but that's our, our focal case right now. And as I said, the point of the emblematic case is to really create a story to share with people so that they can understand the death penalty in a way that sometimes statistics and the raw emotions that people can have around this issue don't always, uh, don't always help us to, to get through. So hopefully those are some good ideas. Like I said, look through this kit there. It's chock full of ideas. It's got some great how-tos. If you're kind of new to activism or new to some of these forms of activism, hopefully these will be good pointers for you. Uh, your field organizer or state definitely abolition coordinator can also help give you some tips if you are new at things and trying to figure out uh, how to do things. So these are the resources that, that we have available. The kit lists all of them. You can see pictures of the buttons and stickers in the kit that you can order from your regional office. Um, there are a couple of videos online. We can send you a, a link to the Troy Davis video. You, you can also um, uh, find that on our Amnesty's YouTube channel. Uh, there are also a bunch of uh, films that have been made over the years about the death penalty. Uh, some we have access to, others you can, you can access uh, through pretty mainstream uh, sources. We've created state-specific pamphlets. These are PDFs that we can send to you that you can copy. They make uh, one, a two to a sheet, and this uh, gives some specific information about uh, things in your state. Uh, we've got t-shirts in our online store, and you can wear a uh, Reggie Clemens t-shirt, an I am Troy Davis t-shirt, or we have one that has stars representing U.S. states that have, that have and don't have the death penalty. Um, and we've got some PowerPoint presentations. So if you want to do a workshop yourself or a teach-in, uh, you don't have to create that from scratch. We can send you that. And, and, uh, and we will send an email to everybody who rsvp to this call with a list of links to these PowerPoints to the kit, to the fact sheets, and a couple of other things that we have mentioned on the phone call. We have a special challenge tonight. Uh, if you uh, would like to win a Reggie Clemens campaign t-shirt, email to dpac at aiusa.org. Uh, the email you see on the screen, dpac at aiusa.org. Email us your creative idea for what you would do with this t-shirt to raise awareness for Reggie Clemens and we will give a handful of people who gave us the, the best uh, creative ideas, we'll mail you a shirt. So that's your, your challenge for tonight is to think about how to creatively um, raise awareness for this key emblematic case. Next. All right, Cynthia, I'll turn it back to you all. Great. Thanks, Laura. Um, so this 
we just wanted to kind of again show everybody who's already signed up as far as some of our student groups um, and universities and high schools throughout the country who have taken this challenge on. And this is an opportunity for us to invite, you know, schools that you don't see up on this list, um, communities that you don't maybe not see on this list, um, to please join us in, in really spreading that awareness. Um, Jordana, Jordana, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Not especially. I would just say that um, feel free to reach out to any of us on the call or, or any of your Amnesty International contacts that you can find in the toolkit about planning these events. We would love to help you out in whatever way that we can, whether by brainstorming the right event to fit your school environment or by walking you through the steps of how a faculty to plan this type of event or that type of event. We really want to help you guys out. And we'd love to see actions everywhere. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Jordana. Um, and Laura, I'm going to, you know, is there anything else as far as kind of a, a thank you and, and goodbye note for everyone? Well, we would really love to thank the National Youth um, Program and the National Youth Advisory Committee, uh, the Counting all crows and everybody who joined on tonight, uh, it's, it's been really wonderful to see such strong attendance and such strong interest in this human rights issue. Uh, we're very excited to see the energy that is building and uh, Brian and I have no doubt that the death penalty will be abolished in this country. And when that happens, it's not going to be um, just a, a victory for human rights in the United States, but it's going to have a really important and deep impact on the rest of the world. I think it's going to make a huge impact on the momentum forward for universal abolition of this outmoded inhuman practice that really is not the best of what uh, human values uh, represent. It's not, the, it's not the, the best thing that we can do in the face to, uh, of horrible tragedies that we know are very real. Um, so do look for an email from us um, with a link with links to the resources. We're also going to send you um, stuff that you can do online through Twitter, Facebook, and other online media to um, to to do during the death penalty action weeks. Um, because I know many of you are online activists, perhaps more than you do things like organizing events in communities. And there's a place for everybody. So we're going to send you some very specific ideas and tools that you can uh, use so that you might expect that um, uh, not tomorrow but uh, in, in the coming days, maybe even next week. So we'll let you know what you can do online for Death Penalty Action Weeks. Um, and definitely follow us on Facebook, uh, like our page, uh, and, and, uh, and, and we'd love to keep up with you and please, please get in touch with your state Death Penalty Abolition Coordinator or your field organizer if, uh, if you don't have one. Um, and we just really want to thank you again for participating tonight and helping to really make this uh, the strong movement that it is becoming. Thanks, Laura, so much. And um, I just sent out that last question, which is raise your hand if you're ready to end the death penalty. And I'm happy to report that almost everyone, we still have a few people, but it looks like over well, okay, now everyone has raised their hand um, and, <laughs> and are ready to, to end the death penalty. And so again, we thank everyone for joining us. Um, we will be sending out an email um, with with PowerPoint presentations for you to share. Um, again, a lot of the links and information that you saw tonight and also how to continue to get involved. And we hope that this is just the beginning of, of you know, the, the journey that's ahead of us together. So I'm going to unmute all of our speakers and, and say bye. And thanks bye. Thanks bye, y'all. Thanks for coming. Bye. Have a great night.